Hey, greetings, everybody. Happy Wednesday. Welcome to the Craig Folly Show on Deadline Detroit. Glad to have you with me once again today. And as you know, normally this time of, well, not this time of year, but normally for this conference, I would be up on Mackinac Island for the annual policy conference hosted by the Detroit Regional Chamber. I, of course, am not there this year, but I'm lucky in that I have a special correspondent for the first time in my career. I have my own actual <laughs> correspondent that I am basically just plucking for free from my friends at the Detroit Free Press. Nancy Kaffer, of course, on the editorial board at the Detroit Free Press. You see her writing in the paper all the time. You may agree with it. You may not. That's the beauty of editorials. Nancy, welcome back. It's a pleasure to have you here. It's nice to be here, Craig. I know, and and I do appreciate your assistance, um, and uh, I'm living somewhat vicariously through you, as you are, I'm sure, enjoying the conference, uh, although it is a lot more work than people realize it is mm -hmm. for journalists, um, you know. Uh, especially those of us like us that cover politics most of the time, mm -hmm. the amount of freebies that we get is zero. So, yeah. you know, people need to understand that. I want to address something else that sometimes comes up when people talk about the conference and whether it's a waste of time and whether or not the press has some sort of, you know, it's, it's weird or inappropriate for media to come to the conference. Because here's the thing. This is not a conference for the media. This is a conference that the chamber holds with the most powerful people in our state, the governor, um, not so much lawmakers this year because they're still working on the budget, but business leaders. And I guess the question I have to ask is, do you want this group up here doing things and making decisions without the press here watching what's going on, without trying to provide some level of accountability about what's happening? I mean, I don't. I think that it's a good idea to have media here covering stuff. So yeah, there's there's no, um, it, it's a lot of work, and it, but it's important. It's part of our jobs is to watch things that are going on. We have, I'm an opinion writer, so I look for opinionated takes on things. My colleagues on the straight news side do really hard work reporting about what happened, trying to get answers out of powerful people who are grouped up here in one place where you can get at them. So it's just, you know, I know that there's some, you know, people like to dog on the conference, which is completely legit. But um, again, the media's role here is covering it, which is why we're here. Well, you know, and people need to remember, too, this used to go on without the press until I believe one radio station here in town actually started going. And then a couple of us said, you know, maybe there should be some room for some other people up there. Chambers work pretty hard to accommodate the media by actually mm -hmm. setting up places where interviews can be done and uh, giving mm -hmm. access to this so that we do have reporters up there fact checking some of the things that are being said on the stage, especially by elected officials, but also mm -hmm. from the business leaders on the island. I mean, I, I read my Twitter feed while this is going on, and it's a whole bunch of reporters asking questions about a statement that somebody has made saying, well, the mayor just said this, but my data and my research and my reporting has shown this. Well, you know, and these are people who have outsized influence on our state and our state politics. They're people who personally make substantial campaign contributions. They are associated with political action committees that make substantial campaign contributions. Is that great? No. I mean, I think my opinion on dark money and big corporate money in politics, I've written a good bit about it. I don't think it's, a, I don't think it's good. But in the system that we have, um, there has to be accountability, transparency, and reporting on it. But anyway, that's not what you, uh, that's not what you called to talk about. Well, you know, but it is because this is, this is something that people talk about. Like I said, I have found value in being there. I've learned a ton of things and overheard some conversations mm -hmm. over the course of my career on that island that gave me an idea of where they were headed when it came to some policy decisions, especially in the legislature back when all the legislators were there. Um, but, but let's talk about what is happening up there because, you know, one of the criticisms is sometimes that, you know, the politicians might not be getting the hard questions up there. And I like it better when journalists have a seat at the table for like mm -hmm. a mayoral round table, as opposed to, uh, business people, because it might not be the same level of hard hitting questioning, uh, that you might get. Uh, but talk about mayor Duggan yesterday. He had an opportunity to talk a little bit about what he wants his legacy to be and also what he thinks he needs to continue working on. No, I think we were all a little surprised. I thought, you know, in the recent years, the chamber has done a format of having someone like the mayor make a speech and then have a Q and a session later. And I think that's what I was expecting. I think when we talked about it yesterday, we were both expecting that other reporters up here were expecting that same format. This was 100% a Q and a with a journalist. Um, and, you know, it was it was not a speech. Uh, it was the mayor and his new um, planning director, who mm -hmm. is a very interesting and uh, thoughtful seeming person. But it was a, it was a it was a Q and A with the two of them, which was um, 
which was interesting, but you know, not not quite what I was expecting. I was thinking that this might be one of the mayor's, you know, few public speeches before the election, but it wasn't really a public speech. You know, they talked a lot about the work that has been going on. Um, Duggan continues to be proud of his demolition program, of um, the way that he has, uh, he, he feels that he's improved things in neighborhoods, that he has improved city services. Um, he talked a little bit about his hard line in um, giving his appointees time to make change and then you're know, dismissing them and moving on if they if they uh, have not made sufficient change. So you know it was a um, it was yeah you know, again it was a it was a more what's the word I'm looking for? It's not scripted. It wasn't a scripted format because it was a live interview with with live questions. But it was uh, you know it, it felt very much along the lines of things that we've we've heard the mayor talk about before. Well, and. and it also sounds as if it was uh, the type of agenda he wanted to talk about as opposed to maybe a debate uh, that he'd have where you could start yeah. asking hard hitting questions about things like the crime rate in the city, uh, yeah. unemployment, equity, you know, the things that we all want answers about in the city. I mean, he, right. he did talk a bit about a focus away from uh, demolition and moving more towards rebuilding right. in, in terms of green space, parks and things like that. Yeah, no, he did talk about that, and that that's you know welcome to hear about. Um, he did not have uh, media availability before or after that, and he, to the best of my knowledge, has not been out mingling in the crowd. So there really was no opportunity for journalists to ask him questions of any type, hard hitting or no. Um, but yeah, he you know he he wants. Of course, he's a candidate. He's a mayor, and he's a candidate running for office. Of course, he wants to talk about the things that he's gotten right, and not really talk about the things that he's gotten wrong. Um, yeah, but like you said, a lot of us have questions about equity. The mayor has consistently sort of rejected this idea of true Detroit, but I think that um, that's not a thing that most of us are buying into. There's there's definitely different standards of living in Detroit, depending on who you are and where you live. I think, you know, two, the only, the, a, two Detroits probably isn't enough There's <laughs> to describe the, the situation. There's multiple Detroits, depending on who you are and where you live. Um, you know, and that's not acceptable. We all need to live in a city with the same access to services, the same um, quality of life, the same level of safety. So, sure. Uh, you know, okay. Uh, Nancy Kaffer, of course, my guest. She's at the Mackinac Policy Conference again today um, and, and giving us an update on what's been going on. Now, one person who has been making the rounds is Governor Whitmer. Uh, mm -hmm. She's had, what, two press conferences, I think, uh, since this whole thing began, talking about various accomplishments and plans that she has uh, for her administration. Um, but I'm wondering if there's been much talk about the budget agreement that uh, was announced. Uh, that also includes provisions for no mask mandates in schools and no vaccine passports of any type in Michigan. I, I, it seems like maybe she had to give in on that to get what she needed in terms of spending on schools and, and public health and, and child care. Uh, but I it seems a I, weird thing to, to compromise on. I think that you have to read this closely, right? So what she has said when asked about that, and people have tried to pin her down a couple of times on this at her two press availabilities, um, what she has said is that when the budget is on her desk, she's going to ha conduct a full legal review, and then she'll make her decision. She does have a line item veto. Which is a big deal, yes. Based on a legal review of the budget. So, um, I mean, you know, there's tactics and strategies. But to me, if you read that closely, I would expect that there's going to be some changes to the budget that, she eventually signs. And and they don't have the votes to override that veto. So, I mean, if she does do right. the line item and exercises it, she will be able to take those things out because, it, you know, that seems to get in the way of the Department of Public Health doing their actual job. Um, yes. Yes, indeed. And I, don't, and I don't think it's legal, which is why, I mean, why she's talking about the concept of the legal review, is that if there's unenforceable um, illegal language like yeah, I don't I don't know that you can restrict the powers of a department by a budget document I think you would have to amend um, the, See, the 
this is where we need our this is where we need our friends at Gongwer for that uh, discussion <laughs> here. And so I'll get John Lindstrom yeah. on here in a couple of days uh, to sort of break that down. But I mean, it is important to note that they did reach a deal on this, and I mean, I think there is some historic money in here, uh, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to children in the state. And um, you know, it, it, it's nice to see them actually come to some sort of a deal because we thought that the concept of compromise between the Republicans in Lansing and the governor was pretty much done. We did. We did. So yeah, this is a, this is a, yeah, this is a deal. They're moving forward on some things that, I mean, that I've wanted to see them do more investment in child, in children, more investment in families. Um, this is of course, the big question is a lot of this is one time money either from federal COVID relief or from um, sales tax boom from the stimulus uh, as a result of the stimulus. So, you know, I think the big question going forward is going to be, can we sustain these investments? Because you don't just put a bunch of money into early, you know, educated child care or something, and then it, you know, it solves the problem and you never have to do it again. You have to continue to sustain that level of spending. Continue to sustain? I write yeah. for a living, I promise, Chris. You have to sustain <laughs> that level of spending for it to have a meaningful impact. Well, especially if people are enjoying that benefit, taking it away from right. them later is going to be a problem. Uh, okay, off topic a little bit, not really off topic, but, you know, one of the things that, uh, this conference is actually pretty known for is bringing in some pretty high profile speakers uh, to talk and, and give presentations. Um, you know, I think Richard Florida is speaking later today, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Florida, the, the darling of 2010. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but I mean, has there been anybody that you've been listening to that you were surprised that you're like, well, that's actually pretty insightful and something that we learned something from while we were up here. Well, the historians, two historians spoke yesterday and you know, I, I mean, we're nerds. We like history. Those are the two most interesting. That should not be, today. that should not be a hallmark of nerdism. <laughs> Liking history should be something that we all appreciate. Fair, very fair. <laughs> um, but no, those were, those were good conversations. Um, I mean, the, the agenda is, I, I get that it was extremely hard to book speakers this year. I mean, you're having to make these decisions back um, months, months ago when no one knew what the deal was going to be like with the virus and so they, they don't necessarily have those um those big names there's no jeffrey canada on the agenda this year you know there's no um there's no donna brazil you know there there's a there are no you know thankfully no newt gingrich uh <laughs> was here one year many years ago i forgot about that yes <laughs> right but um but they're, you know, it's it's a it's a lot of folks that you've seen and heard from before. Um, <laughs> one of the things I was actually kind of looking forward to was uh, a panel on the future of the Republican Party that was this afternoon because I'm really curious about that. It uh, the speakers were Michael Seal and oh, I'm going to blank on the name, but I'm looking at the agenda. Who was it? It was a person, O'Brien. Okay. I'm really uh, I'm really impressing well, everyone with my well, command of the facts there. Michael and, Steele's talking about the future of the Republican Party, even though he is on the outs with the Republican Party right, right now. Right. I mean, he's a Lincoln Project guy. Robert O'Brien, former okay. United States National Security Advisor in the Trump administration. And my big takeaway from that is that these two guys are not connected to the Republican Party. They were talking about how January 6th was a bright line, about how, you know, endorsing the big lie wasn't acceptable and pulling shows consistently that they are, you know, that that is not the belief of the majority of the Republican Party. So it was a little, I was, I was really hoping to get some insight there. And then I don't feel like it was particularly helpful. Yeah, either. well, I don't think they know necessarily, uh, based no, on what I've been witnessing for the last, uh, the last five years. Yeah, no, there still seems to be this belief that, that somehow there's a true Republican Party of uh, people who are mainly defined by fiscal conservatism out there. And if there is, I see absolutely no evidence of it. No, probably not. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't think we're going to get any real answers on that up in the island since a lot of the Republicans are not up there this time. So, That's uh, correct. Yeah. you know, we shall see. All right, Nancy, I'm going to let you get back to work. I know you've got a lot to do up there because your day is far from over uh, because once all the stuff ends, the writing begins. So mm -hmm. we'll be looking forward to reading your stuff. Uh, and of course, that includes social media posts and everything else that you're responsible for these days. So uh, we will leave you alone now. Well, thank you, Craig. Always a pleasure. All right. Nancy Kaffer, again, of the editorial board at the Detroit Free Press, joining us live today from Mackinac Island. We always appreciate it.